Okay, hi everybody and welcome to this sample saddle geek consultation. Um, we're working today with a horse named Charlie. He's a 10 year old thoroughbred. He's about 16 one hands high um, and he is a lower level eventer. And for purposes of today, I won't be using the owner's real name. Um, we'll be calling her Sue. So hello to Sue and thank you to Sue for letting us all kind of be along for the ride. So first I want to start by talking about the horse's confirmation and then we'll talk briefly about the rider's confirmation and get kind of a general sense of what this horse needs. Um, and then Sue has asked me to evaluate a saddle that she has on trial, so we'll talk a little bit about that saddle that she has on trial and why I think she should send it back and not use it. And then we'll talk about how she can move forward with her current budget um, and look at some saddles that maybe she could look into. So first let's talk about Charlie, who is a very handsome fellow. The first thing to notice about this shot is I really like the shot that Sue has gotten of Charlie. Um, he's square in the front, he's fairly square in the back with his legs lined up front and back. Um, also, when she sent me this shot, it was slightly tilted, right? I always try to look at the angle of the horse's feet in relationship to each other, and I had to rotate this photo slightly because I wanted to get a good sense of the relationship between his withers, the low point of his back, and the point of his croup. Um, and we can see now that we've kind of evened Charlie out, right, to approximately where he's standing straight um, on the ground. He's not quite croup high, but he's also not exceptionally uphill. Um, and I see this a lot with thoroughbreds. Um, also notice that the key fitting issue here for Charlie, which again is very, very common with thoroughbreds, is that he's got some gaps behind his scapula bone. So here's his scapula bone, right, his shoulder bone, um, and this rotates back and forth when he trots and canters and gallops. Um, and then behind it, between the, his wither and spine here and his scapula, he's got a pretty significant dip. Um, and on a lot of thoroughbreds, this is just purely genetic. Um, it's not necessarily related to conditioning. In fact, um, although it is true that generally as a horse is worked correctly and comes up in the top line and develops more muscle, he will um, widen out here. It's also true that some thoroughbreds are gonna be like this forever. Um, and a lot of them as they gain a lot of cardiovascular fitness, like as you maybe move toward a training three day event or preliminary level, or certainly moving to intermediate level, um, as they lose sort of all of their fat um, and become lean, mean, machines, they can actually sort of narrow back out in this area. Um, so Charlie's key fitting issue is these dips behind the withers, and we'll talk today about how you can address that. Um, a lot of people, when they see this, um, and they take a wither tracing of their horse, which would happen about two to three inches behind the scapula here, right, when they're trying to appraise tree width, they're going to arrive at the conclusion that a horse like Charlie needs a narrow treed saddle. And if you take nothing from this video today, take away this idea, which is that I have very, very, very rarely encountered a horse who truly needs a narrow tree. Um, I've met some horses who wear trees that are marked narrow, but these tend to come from brands where the narrow tree is actually, um, like the whole brand runs, runs wide. And an example of this is some of the county saddles, right? Um, what they call a narrow or a medium narrow is anybody else's medium narrow to medium. Um, so in, I wouldn't call that a true narrow horse, right? Um, I'm talking about a horse who truly needs a saddle that's incredibly, right, sort of thin through the gullet. Um, like a lot of people look at this horse and they say, oh, well, I have to match this horse to a wither tracing, so I'm going to have to really get a super narrow saddle. And we're going to see on Charlie today what happens when you follow that very, um, right, it seems like great logic, and I can see why people walk down that primrose path, and we'll talk about how to address this in another way, um, because something very bad is going to happen that's going to be a deal killer for saddle fit. So again, Charlie has, um, I'd say it's a moderately high wither. He's certainly not a shark fin wither. I've seen much, much worse. He has a dip behind um, his scapula bone. He has a fairly pronounced scapula bone, which will rotate back and forth um, as he moves right in motion. So there is some chance that as this, this bone rotates in the trot and canter that it may hit a tree point if we're not careful. Um, and again, that's one of the concerns with a narrow treed saddle. Um, he also right, has his, mid, his low point in the back is at a pretty reasonable spot, and then he rises up to his croup. So we would call this a fairly curvy backed horse. Also notice like a lot of thoroughbreds here in the back, um, and I'll switch to this shot of this stack house saddle to show you. Although Charlie is um, right, a typical thoroughbred up front, right? he may have these dips behind the withers, he may be not a thin horse, right? but he's built lean like a thoroughbred. Um, when you go out toward the back of his flank here in this area, he's actually quite well sprung, right? He's almost like a coffee table in the very, very back of the saddle. So you have to be careful when shopping for a, a horse like this that you choose a panel in the rear that has what I call a good roof slope. Um, and by roof slope, I mean that if you go to, say, New York or Canada where it snows a lot, the roofs are very pointy. You see how I'm making my mouse, right? They're very, very steep. Um, if you have a slab-sided horse, they can need a very strong roof slope in their panels. You can see here that this stack house has um, a pretty distinctive slope right to the panel. 
Um, Charlie needs a shallow roof slope, right? Something that you might see on a roof in um, Georgia or Florida, right? Somewhere there where it doesn't snow a lot. Um, so one thing I don't love about this stack house, although this is not the absolute deal killer, is I think that these panels are a little too slopey for him here in the rear. I'd really prefer a panel that sits more flat, right? To better match the angle of his back. Um, but again, I'd say there's kind of a tolerance zone here, you know, maybe 10 degrees in either direction, as long as it's not digging here into the back of his flanks. Um, and I can't quite see that from this picture. It would be better appraised on the ground by Sue, right? She could get on a muck bucket right behind Charlie and she could have a good solid look and decide that. Um, you can also mitigate that issue somewhat by using correctional padding under the saddle. But again, you want to be within a tolerance zone of about 10 degrees. Um, and in, perfect, in a perfect world, you want a brand that actually lies quite a bit flatter here in the back, even though it accommodates him up here. So let's talk about how you would accommodate this dip behind the wither. It's a super common issue. And I'm going to rely as visual aids here on some blog posts from Kit Hazelton when she was working at Trumbull Mountain Tack Shop. She's actually now working independently um, as a saddler at Panther Run Saddlery. Again, that's pantherrunsaddlery.com if you'd like to talk to the person who made these. Um, and she wrote these really great blog posts showing how the K panel works, right? Um, the technology that I'm talking about when I say K panel looks like this, right? Notice how unlike many cheaper saddles or saddles that we used to ride in in the old days, they used to kind of have panels that went along this curvature. There's this fairly um, large triangle shaped wedge added to the panel shape, right? That beefs up the panel under the trapezius muscle, right? And really fills in that dip behind the wither. Um, now it's named originally for Kay Hastelow, right? She's um, a master saddler in England. She's actually, I think, the incoming president of the Society of Master Saddlers. Um, but you should know that this, it doesn't always go by this name. Um, some brands have this panel, but they don't call it a K panel. For example, this is a uh, Frank Baines Reflex. You can see that same um, right built up panel area, but this is a standard panel for Frank Baines. They don't call it anything. Um, right, and Barnsby calls it a dropped panel, right? Frank Baines calls it nothing. Same thing with, um, this is a Prestige Roma. It's actually an Italian saddle. And it too has this built up area and this brand doesn't call it anything either. Um, and actually this stack house that Sue has taken out on trial has to some degree or another, um, right, some build up in that area. So it's not a bad match for Charlie's needs in that regard. Um, it also has a very short panel, right? A short panel that doesn't extend all the way down the flap, um, which can be good for the kind of shoulder that Charlie has. But to look at how this works, um, Kay has some, I'm sorry, Kit has some really great pictures. She's shown what a standard panel would look like on a typical horse. And you can see that there's this big empty space here, right? And um, the K panel technology fills that in, right? It attempts to kind of come into this gap and add additional space um, to create better contact, um, better weight distribution. And most importantly, thinking about our friend Charlie, it creates some slide room for this scapula bone, right? As his scapula kind of wags back and forth as he trots and canters, rather than hitting a tree point, it's going to slide under that soft area of the K panel. Now, the good news about the K panel is that, as you've already seen, there are a lot of saddles that have this built right in. The bad news about the K panel is that these tend to be expensive saddles, <laughs> right? Um, these tend to start, I can name a few, right, that retail kind of around the $2,000 mark. I can name a very, very few that retail under $1,500. But by and large, saddles that have a built-in K panel shape like this are going to be at $3,000 and up. Um, you will also hear some people claim that this is a technology primarily found on British Benchmade saddles, right? Um, saddles made in Walsall, England by master craftsmen from the Society of Master Saddlers. And while it's true that almost all of those Walsall made brands do have a built-in K panel, there are actually some French and Italian brands that do it as well, right? Amerigo has it as a standard panel. Prestige has it on some, but not all of its products, um, especially the Prestige Wolf Locked products, which are newer, right? Like the Prestige Roma here is a $2,100 saddle. It's very appealing to a lot of budget shoppers for that reason. Um, you can also find it on certain French brands. Um, French brands tend to have panels that are not customizable, but some brands like Devacu and Voltaire will actually build you a panel um, that is built up in this area. For example, in Devacu, it's the PX5, PX6 options, right? PX5 means built up in the front. PX6 means built up in this range here um, in sort of the K panel area. So the good news is there's a much wider range, I think, of drop panel saddles than a lot of people think. Um, the bad news is not all of them have it, right? Um, and the question is, well, what do you do, especially if you're a budget shopper? Or as we start talking about the rider, right, as we start talking about Sue, she has needs as well, right? So once we start looking at Sue's needs, we might disqualify a lot of these saddles that have that drop panel shape for Charlie. Well, one thing you can do 
Um, and again, I'm going to whisper this a little bit. I'm going to say it in hushed tones because some saddle fitters who are trained by Society of Master Saddlers or by brands like County that feel really strongly that this should be built into the panel will not like this logic. Um, but it's the frank reality of what most people do. A lot of people just use a half pad. Um, let's look at a half pad for a moment. This is a Mattis sheepskin half pad, right? By far the most popular sheepskin half pad on the market, although um, I like a lot of the cheaper ones, so don't feel like you have to buy a Mattis. But look at the shape of the half pad, right? It's got this sort of lobe shape in the front. This is not a coincidence, folks, right? The half pad functionally simulates this shape of a K panel, right? It's giving that same effect of adding some bulk in this area. Now, if you have a horse like Charlie, right, who's really got some gaps behind the withers, that might act not actually be sufficient. You may need to buy one of the shimmable sheepskin or cotton half pads that allows you to add additional bulk in this area, right? They've got pockets, these shimmable pads up here, and you can add additional shims, make this area even fatter, right, and more sort of beefy, and then you would sort of arrive at this shape. Now, some saddle fitters, when I say that, are going to call sacrilege. They're like, no, 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 the saddle should fit without any correctional padding, blah, 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 blah. And my answer to that is, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Right? If the horse doesn't have a problem with it, what's the problem? Right? So I believe that a lot of correctional padding is used poorly um, by people who don't understand what it does. Right? For example, go ahead and raise your hand if this is the first time in this screencast that you've ever thought about half pads right, simulating a K-panel shape. Right? If this is your first time at that rodeo, it doesn't make you a bad horseman. It's just something a lot of us were never taught. Um, you know, if you're in that club and you're just slapping half pads under there for giggles because, you know, quote unquote, Dobbin will be more comfortable with more padding. Well, you know, that's like saying my boots fit me perfectly. So I'll just go ahead and wear them with a thick wool sock that makes them tighter because surely that's more comfortable because there's more padding. Right? It's kind of it's it's not it doesn't make any sense. Right. It sounds good. It feels truthy, but it doesn't make our horses more comfortable. So I'm not saying everyone in the world go buy a half pad. I'm saying if you have a horse like Charlie, right, and you can't um, find or can't afford or like don't, you, right, you have other needs that require you to buy a saddle that doesn't have a built-in K panel shape, think quite seriously about investing in one of these shimmable sheepskin half pads, which are about 150 or $200, and using the shim system. It's also a system I recommend if your horse is growing and changing, if you have either a young horse or a horse very freshly off the track, or maybe a horse that was starved in its previous home or coming off of a long layover. Um, the horse may not need a K-panel shape in the long term or may need um, a wider tree in the long term. You can use one of these sheepskin half pads to get you through. Um, and I think Charlie's kind of on that line, right? It would be nice to get him a built-in K-panel, but I think you could absolutely address this with some good correctional padding, especially if you had a great saddle fitter involved that you were willing to, um, like, who was willing to look at that half pad and work with you. So that's Charlie. Let's talk about the saddle that Charlie's wearing and why I don't like it for him. Okay, this is a lovely stack house saddle that I'm guessing Sue got from Fine You Saddles. It's a steal of a deal. For those of you who are not familiar with Stackhouse, um, David Stackhouse is a fully custom maker who's building $5,000 plus saddles. He has excellent customer service. Um, he's the kind of guy who, if you order new, he comes to your barn with naked saddle trees and places them directly on your horse and like does things like put you up in your saddle and he draws like with his hand the correct shape of a flap for you. So these are ultra premium products, top quality leather, outstanding balance, excellent workmanship but by and large, they're being made custom for particular horses. Um, and that means two things on the used market. One is that they tend to be cheap on the used market because they're so specialized um, and they all fit so differently that it can be hard to find a buyer for them. And secondly, it means right that the chances that you're going to fit one stack house to another horse are kind of dicey. Um, so here's what's happening with Charlie in this saddle. And I'm going to go ahead and draw on this. A lot of people would look at this picture and they would say, oh, well, the saddle's just, um, it's a little pommel high. It must just be too narrow for Charlie. Um, and that's true. But I think what's really happening is, remember we talked about how this saddle actually does have kind of a K-panel shape to it here, right? It's both quite narrow through the gullet, but it also has this K-panel shape. I think that's what's happening, is that between that K-panel and the fairly narrow tree, this saddle is sliding back on Charlie's back, further back from where it belongs. Because let's look. Even though I can't quite see it in this picture, I'm pretty sure Charlie's scapula bone is about here, okay? And your saddle's tree point should be two to three inches behind the scapula bone. So that means that the tree point should be roughly here. And if we look at this saddle, in reality, the tree point is back here, 
that's bad kids right and if we were to just try and kind of lift this saddle up and place it closer to charlie's shoulder what we would get is a tree that's so narrow and so much beefy padding here that charlie's big scapula bone would just push it backwards right so it would end up exactly where we are now um, so in addition to that, another thing I don't love is because it's been pushed back, it's actually too long for his back. So I'm going to draw a line right here. This is a tricky thing to judge at a distance. Um, and I'm, I'm mainly doing it right kind of guesswork. So I'm going to tell Sue to go ahead and check my logic on Charlie. But um, every horse's rib cage has a slightly different slope. And it's important that your saddle sit entirely on the horse's rib cage and not back here in this zone where there's just sort of flank muscle. Um, you can imagine how hard it is on a horse to be carrying the back of the saddle with a lot of potential weight on it, just on top of muscle with no bone underneath it to support it. Um, and because of where the saddle ends up landing, because it's too narrow and it's pushed back too far, I believe it's exceeding Charlie's um, length of rib cage. Um, and again, this is much easier to do in person when you can really get your hands on the horse and kind of dig for the rib. I usually dig for the rib kind of down here, and then I follow with my fingers up to the top to kind of get a feel for where the 18th thoracic vertebrae is. That's the last vertebrae on the rib cage. Um, but you know, we can kind of see it in the picture. I'm guessing that Charlie's rib cage kind of goes on this slope. And so you can see how that means that we've got an inch or two of saddle hanging out behind where ideally it should be placed. Now the news gets even worse, right? Because the saddle is sitting too far back, right? And now it's pommel high because it's narrow. That means that the back of the saddle is going to be disproportionately weighing down on Charlie's back in that sensitive area. It's gonna soar this horse really fast. He might be okay for a ride or two or three, but you start riding this horse over fences in the saddle like this, you will be sorry. Okay, so let's talk about one more thing that's wrong with this saddle. Then let's talk about whether anything can be done to save it, right? What would it take to make this stack house work? And then let's talk about some other options. So I'm gonna go to another picture that Sue sent me of Charlie with this saddle to, um, girthed up. Here's the other thing I don't love about this stack house. Look at how far back the girth is placed on this horse. And it's actually caused partly because the saddle, again, we've talked about is too far back on the horse because it's too narrow and blah, 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 right? It's exceeding his rib cage, la, 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 la. But here's another deal killer, right? When you actually look at the saddle, um, look at where the billets are. Do you see how far back they are on the tree? Let me try and find a picture of that for you where you can see it better. Okay, there we go. Do you see how the, the billets are attached almost to the back of the seat, right? So on a lot of saddles, the billets are kind of up here, right, in this zone. On this saddle, they're back here, right? And uh, for a cross-country saddle, right, or a saddle that was placed correctly on the horse, that might make a lot of sense, right? Because the saddle is designed to be sitting quite a bit further up on the horse, right? Imagine moving the whole saddle forward about three inches. Um, and then the flap is going to come up over the shoulder, right? The soft flap that isn't the tree point will be way up here. And then that would put the girth billets right where they belong. But on Charlie, I still think the girth billets are going to be a little too far back, um, even if you were to get this in the right place. So what would it take? Okay, what would it take to make this saddle work? In my opinion, if you really want to make the saddle work, first thing you'd have to do is you'd have to widen the tree. Um, and that's going to be a quick $200 right off the top. And $200 is a very conservative estimate on the price. That's the price from Smith Worthington in Connecticut. I'd give them a call and confirm that quote. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a little more than that, right? And that includes, um, doesn't include shipping back and forth. If you get it done locally, a more common price for that um, from most saddlers is about $300 to $350. So not a cheap procedure. And the saddle is already pushing the top of Sue's budget, right? So that's really something to think about. The other thing to think about is that trees, most trees that are static that are not designed to be adjusted, right? There are some brands out there that are designed for adjustment. Stackhouse is not designed for adjustment. Um, so you're gonna get maybe 10 degrees more out of this saddle, right? Um, if you widen it. And in the process, you're gonna lose some wither clearance, right? And it's clearance you can't really afford to lose, right? Because even slid back further than it belongs on Charlie's back, he doesn't have much wither clearance. Now, bear with me, okay, use, let's try and picture this. Let's imagine if Sue widens the saddle about 10 degrees, right, so that she actually gets the widening. So now it's sitting kind of securely behind Charlie's scapula bone where it belongs, two to three inches behind his scapula bone. And then she raises the whole sucker up, right, by sticking a half pad under it, maybe with some shims up front she might get away with all of that, okay? Then the saddle might actually work, but it's kind of a punt. And my feeling is, why are you doing all that? Just go get another saddle that works better. 
Now, if Sue had a smaller budget and she had limited options, I might say, you know, go ahead and try this. But she's got other options. So I would not recommend this, Sue. Don't, okay? Because you might still end up with that girth problem. Now, if you really, really insist, Sue, right, and you're really enchanted with the idea of trying to widen this saddle, and again, maybe this is something you could talk to David Stackhouse about. He's got great customer service and he's happy to talk to people about his used products. You could consider girthing the saddle up on the front two billets. We were all taught, right, pony club style, to girth up on one and three. But gee, look, gee willikers, whoever used to own this saddle had been told the same thing by their fitter because they used the front two billets, right? That's gonna buy you back maybe just an inch or so in terms of where the girth is sitting. And you might actually manage to get it where it belongs, right up here in Charlie's girth groove. So if you wanted to save the stack house, that's my advice. I wouldn't do that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the rider, Sue. Um, and the reason I wanna talk about Sue is it's gonna give us a feel for what to look for in other saddles on the market, and you'll see why I'm recommending the saddles that I am. So this is Sue. Hi, Sue. Um, she asked me to blot out her face, no prob. Um, and I know the pictures are a little blurry, but we'll get the idea. Here she is sitting in her current stack house saddle. And we'll notice that Sue, um, although right, she might describe herself as long from hip to thigh, I wouldn't describe her that way. Um, I describe her as like very proportional for 5'7", right? She's tall. 5'7 is pretty tall for an American woman. Um, and she's, she's you know, she's got a nice body. She's got nice thin legs. Sue, I wish I had your legs, let me tell you what, um, right? But if you look, it's not really that she's long from hip to thigh because she's very proportional with her lower leg and she's very proportional with her torso, right? Sort of the length from here to here, right from her shoulder to her hip, her hip to her knee, her knee to her foot is all very similar. And that's wonderful, Sue, because shopping for a disproportionate rider is hell. Um, so I can see that this saddle that you're riding in, it looks okay-ish on the flat, right? But we get the real story here over fences. We can see that the flap is not quite forward enough for your leg, right? Part of it is how you're jumping. You're jumping a little head, but you know what? I'm not George Morris, I'm not here to judge. But I suspect actually, Sue, that this saddle is contributing to you doing that, right? Um, it's causing you to do that a little bit. So you need a little bit more of a forward flap. I do like the seat size for you. Um, you know, with your tiny little butt, you know, if we were judging just by your butt, I'd say you probably belong in a 17, but because of the length of your leg to create a little bit more room and a little bit better relationship with the stirrup bar, right? To push the stirrup bar a little bit further forward on the saddle so that you've got a little more room for that leg when you rise into a jumping position, I'd like to see you in a 17 and a half. Don't buy an 18, you're gonna swim in it, okay? So that's my advice about the rider, All right? So let's take sort of a quick trip around the house here. What do we need for Charlie and this rider? Charlie needs a moderately curvy tree and panels because he's got a curvy back. He needs a drop shape up front, um, drop panel shape up front, or we need to count on simulating that with a half pad. And it's up to Sue whether she's comfortable taking the second option, but I'm telling you, Sue, I've seen it work with a million thoroughbreds and you're an inventor, you're in a discipline where it's not gonna hurt you aesthetically, it's not gonna hurt your scores. Think about it, Sue. I'll admit it, I've done it myself, there's no shame, okay? Um, in terms of width, Width is a very hard thing for me to judge at a distance. Very difficult, um, right? I'd really need a wither tracing to truly know how wide Charlie is um, or some really good comps, right? Like several examples of saddles that I'm familiar with in particular widths that he's worn. Um, but you know, I'm guessing he's probably more of a medium or a medium narrow tree. He's not a true narrow. He's also not a medium wide. And that matters because a lot of the French builds like Devaku and Taris and so forth, their standard tree off the rack is gonna be a medium wide, right? And the only way to snug those up to medium or medium narrow is to have these customized panel systems. Um, one of the brands that does have a medium tree standard that's French is Delgrange. And we'll talk about Delgrange in a minute because Sue's trainer has been riding this horse in a Delgrange. And I want us to think about why that saddle's working for the horse and also why it does and doesn't work for Sue. So also for Charlie, it would be ideal if the saddle were upswept in the rear, but he can probably wear some rear gusseted saddles. And what I mean by that is this saddle, for example, is upswept in the rear, right? Do you see how the, the whole panel kind of slides up into the sky, roller coaster style, um, so that the very, very back of the panel, right, sort of sweeps up. It's not like the stack house, right? Let me go ahead and pull up the stack house again which has a slight gusset in the rear. You see how this is sort of sticking out here in the rear a little bit? The idea of the rear gusset is to elongate the length of the bearing surface of the saddle to give just a few more square inches that the overall rider weight can be distributed across. And that's very noble, except that sometimes you run out of room, <laughs> right? If you run out of room on the horse's back, like we have in this example where the saddle slid too far back, now we've got a big pointy thing in the back 
that's causing the saddle to slide off the rib cage onto the soft tissue. So Charlie can probably wear some such saddles as long as the whole saddle stays on the rib cage. Um, and again, I don't think he has an exceptionally short rib cage. It's that this saddle is sliding back for particular reasons. Um, you know, so that's something to think about. Finally, he has a fairly forward girth groove. I would think about that. I don't think it's a major issue in the fit, but do be mindful of girth placement, right? Be, be aware of buying a saddle like the stack house where the, girths, the, the girth billets are way far back, right? And you'd either want to girth up on one and two or even better, just buy a saddle where the girth billets are further up in a more sort of moderate position. For the rider, right, we'd like to see about 17 and a half inches. Um, her budget is roughly 2200 to 2750, prefers to stay on the low end of that. Um, and she prefers a medium deep seat or less. Um, she likes a forward flap to accommodate her leg. And she'd like a saddle with some durability, but she also doesn't want to ride, you know, like on a, a brick, right? So none of these 40 year old Steubens with no padding whatsoever. I've also written here a more open U-shaped seat architecture with a medium to long working center, no sit right here effect. And I want to show you what I mean by that. I'm just guessing here, Sue, okay? I'm guessing based on the saddles that you told me you liked and the saddles that you told me that you didn't like. Stackhouse tends to build a saddle that is more of an open architecture. And the best way to recognize an open architecture is to see a saddle that doesn't have one, okay? So let's start with, um, let's see, the Dell Grange Partition. This is a very popular saddle on the market, um, and a lot of people really like this saddle. But do you see how this saddle has a very pronounced V-shaped seat architecture, right? The whole saddle, pommel and cantle, leads directly to this point right here. It says sit right here, right? And you don't have a lot of freedom with your hips or thighs to move elsewhere, right? So a lot of people find this to be a very secure feeling. I will admit that I actually ride in a very similar saddle. It's the, um, I ride in an Amerigo Close Contact. This is an Amerigo Vega, and you can see the same effect of like sit right here, right right behind this high pommel. The whole cantle slides down to it. The saddles may be a little bit more forgiving in terms of having room to slide your hips backward compared to the partition, which is really sit right here. You know, but um, this is a CWD SEO2, again, an incredibly popular saddle on the market, and it says sit right here. So you hear a lot of people complain about, oh, I can't stand the high pommel on those French saddles. Well, it's not really the high pommel. It's that you're parked right behind it, okay? So I think that probably Sue doesn't like this because she reports things like that she likes her trainer's um, Kronos, which is a Del Range Kronos. It's a cross-country saddle. Do you see how this seat architecture is a more moderate U shape? There's no sit right here, right? It's more of a gentle slope, right? No particular place on the seat that forces the rider in. Certainly there is a low point, there is a balance point on this saddle, but you have a little more freedom to kind of uchi scooch and do what you need to do. I'm not saying that's better. I'm just saying it's different, right? <laughs> from this sort of sit right here effect that you see on a lot of the French tack. Um, but Sue also said she wasn't crazy about the blocking on the saddle and that her horse is a little sensitive, right? He doesn't like all of the feedback from a mono flap. Um, so she'd really prefer something with dual flaps. So Sue, when I say I'm looking for more open seat architecture, this is what I mean, okay? I'm trying to keep you out of the sit right here saddles, right? And um, that's one of the wonderful things about Stackhouse is he does not build a sit right here saddle unless you ask him to. So you can see again, this saddle has a pretty high pommel, but there's still a lot of room here in what's called the working center. There's still some room to kind of oochie scooch around. The technical saddle fitting term here is medium working center, but forget I said that, okay? You just kind of want like a U-shaped, not a very V-shaped seat. Okay, finally, moment of truth. If you were going to move on from the stack house and look at some other things, right, and you couldn't find a used stack house that really worked for you and your horse, here are some of the saddles I would consider, and I'm gonna move from cheap to more expensive, okay? So, um, one thing that you could look at is you could look at, um, right, some French, some foam saddles um, that are quite cheap, right? And then you can use a half pad under them. So I'm actually showing you a black Kentar, I think it is, from Middleburg Tack. Um, the reason it's so cheap is because it's black, right? And eventers tend to buy black, but the hunter jumper market doesn't buy black saddles in general. And that makes them quite cheap. So this is a lot of saddle for the money. Kentar is a good British brand, right? So there's certainly some like extreme budget options. And don't worry, part of this consultation service is um, I will send these links to Sue, right? So she will have links directly to all of these saddles. She won't have to try and like furiously take Google notes. So that's sort of the extreme budget end. 
You could also look at some um, builds that are kind of mid-range. This is called the Walsall Saturday Cell Francaise. And it's actually, in most senses of the word, it's actually a Crosby. Um, Walsall Saddlery Company is a British benchmade company, but they are the contract maker for the Crosby saddles that were so popular in the 90s um, and that are actually still kind of around. So functionally, this is a Crosby, okay? But it's a Crosby that's kind of aesthetically trying to be more like a French saddle, right? We can see sort of um, this embellished detail here, right? The embroidery. We can see the very forward flap cut that's popular among the French saddles. We can see a, a more forward um, stirrup bar placement kind of implied by the location of um, the jockey flap here. And notice, nice U-shaped architecture, right? It's pretty open. When we look at the under panels though, right, and we can see the girth placement's a little more moderate, right? Um, right, the billets are more sort of here. They're not way, way, way in the back of the saddle like they were on the stack house. Um, but the panels notice, although they're built up here, they're foam panels and they're very flat, right? So probably on this saddle, you're looking at having to use a sheepskin half pad, right? Or um, a shimmable correction half pad. Also, it's not entirely clear from the picture what the curvature is of the tree. I think this one is curvy enough but you'd probably wanna get some clarification from the vendor. Um, but this is a saddle that's available for trial and for the bargain price of $1,200, right? You could really luck out here. And again, this is a 17 and a half um, and it's a medium tree. Moving up the chain just a little bit, this is the Thornhill Paris II. Um, and I really like this little product. I think it's one of the better knockoffs of French type saddle architecture at a lower price. I'm not sure I love it for Sue, and the reason I say that is because, as you can see, it's a little bit deeper of a seat. It's sort of a true medium deep seat, whereas this Walsall Saddlery saddle is a little more on the, the shallow side, like the Kronos, like the Stackhouse. So I'm worried that um, Sue's not going to be crazy about the depth on this, but it has a nice grippy leather. It has a nice seat architecture, right? It has a curvy tree. Um, I really like the build quality on this saddle, so it's something to think about. I personally, Sue, wouldn't put it real high on my list for your search, um, but it's an option and it retails at like 1200 bucks, which is a steal. Moving up the chain, um, you could try a Pessoa Gen X. I am not always crazy about Pessoa's products, um, but the Gen X is the one that I would pick in this situation for someone who wanted to use a sheepskin half pad, right, a correctional half pad underneath, needed a moderately curvy tree, and again, see that fairly open seat architecture. I'm not sure it's my top pick for use, Sue, so partly because the flap architecture, it's a little bit straight, right? It's got a forward flap, but it's not super forward. Um, I don't love the leather quality on some of the Pessoas, including the natural. Um, you know, it's okay, but it's not amazing, right? And for 2200 to 2750 you could have amazing, right? I also think that um, the oil pull leather on this Thornhill or the green leather on this Walsall Saddlery saddle, <laughs> saddle are going to best the leather on this, this Pessoa. But hey, I'm here to give you all your options, okay? And one of the nice things about this Pessoa is it does have an adjustable gullet, right? So that may give you a little bit of flexibility in terms of playing around, trying to figure out the right combination of tree width and um, sheepskin, um, sorry, correctional padding in under, sorry, correctional padding um, behind the scapula bone that we've talked about. So um, another possibility, moving up the chain, this is the Smith Worthington Stellar Altair. Um, Smith Worthington is a brand from Connecticut. They're building really super solid, um, very high quality saddles. Um, this is a really nice saddle. It's got kind of the tack and grip of a calfskin saddle, but it's actually made of a cowhide, like a glove cowhide. So it's quite a bit more durable than a traditional calfskin. Again, something to watch, Sue, is that it's fairly deep, right? It's truly a medium deep seat, but it doesn't have that firm V-shaped architecture, so you may be comfortable. It also has a U-shaped tree, which might really work well for Charlie, and it has a wool-flocked panel, if that's really important to you. But do notice that on the, right, the, the panels, it's a more traditional panel. It doesn't have that K-panel shape. So again, you're looking at using um, some sort of shimmable pad solution to make this work. But it's a bargain price. 1800 bucks, right? And Smith Worthington will custom bend this tree. It is designed to be fully adjustable across the range of um, possible widths by the dealer. They will bend it to whatever size you need for Charlie. Um, if you want to discuss this option, I would recommend going to smithworthington.com, call their phone number, ask for Kurt. I really like Kurt on their staff. He will shoot you straight. He will not sell you something that is not good for you and your horse. Um, and um, he's an excellent saddle fitter. So one thing to know about this Smith Worthington is that resale on the saddle is very difficult. 
Um, for whatever reason, Smith Worthington is a hard resell on the market. You will take a very large loss if you ever need to resell this saddle. Um, so that's something to consider. Okay, now we're moving up into what I call sort of premium high-end products, right? These are products that retail at $3,000 to $4,000. They're sort of the cream of the crop. Um, and I've pulled sort of some from my quick trip around the internet. This is a floor model Prestige Charisma Dion. And in general, Prestige builds saddles with that very sit right here, V-shaped architecture, but the Charisma D is an exception, right? It's really built for the hunter market, and it's got that kind of more open seat architecture that Sue seems to prefer, along with a more forward flap. It does have a foam panel, so again, we're looking at that shimmable cor correction half pad to make this work. Something to know about when you shop for Prestige saddles, right, is this saddle retails for $3,800. It's on sale as a floor model for $1,995, smoking deal. Okay, something to know about shopping for prestiges is that they're sized a little strangely, right? They're sized as 16, 17, and 18 for the rider, and that rarely correlates with reality. A lot of 16 inch prestiges actually measure 16 and a half. A lot of 17 inch prestiges actually measure 17 and a half, and a lot of 18 inch prestiges measure true, right? They measure 18. So when you buy a used prestige, you need to call the saddlery and ask them to put a tape measure on it, right? And specifically measure from the button to the middle of the cantle to make sure that like that's actually accurate. Um, you can also ask them to read you the serial number, which will always begin with a 16, 17, or 18. Um, let's see. Another thing is you'll want to inquire about the width, right? the tree width on this saddle. Um, Prestige saddles, again, are dealer adjustable. Um, by VTO Saddlery, I think, does it. Um, and I think Equestrian Imports in Florida also does it. Um, costs about 200 or 300 bucks, but it is, again, designed to be fully adjustable across the range of the saddle. You'll hear some people tell you that Prestige can only be adjusted, as they say, two centimeters in either direction. According to Paul at VTO Saddlery, this is not the case. Um, you can actually adjust them more than that, but you can only do two centimeters at a time, right? So he has to superheat the tree points and then bend it two centimeters and let it rest. And then the next day he comes back and he does it again. Um, so if you need more information about saddle width, vtosaddlery.com, look up any of the Prestige saddles on their site. They have some really great information there about tree width. I'm guessing for your horse, Sue, he probably needs something in the range of maybe a 33 centimeter. Um, 34 is probably a little big for him. 32, mm, hard for me to say, right? 32 might work, but it depends on how many shims you need to stick under it. You might end up with it being too snug. So I don't know. I would talk to um, the vendor about that. Moving up. This is a used Prestige um, Bliss Liberty jump saddle. This is a British Benchmade saddle, and this picture sucks. Um, so let me show you the stock picture. This is the stock picture of the Bliss Liberty jump um, that I pulled from the internet. You can see, again, very open seat architecture, forward flap. The aesthetics are really pointed toward the um, eventing market, and this saddle is quite expensive. It retails around $4,000. Um, I'll tell you a secret. I don't think they're worth quite that much. I think they're actually right more reasonably priced around like 30 to 3500. But it doesn't matter because this one is on super duper sale for $2800, <laughs> right? So, um you might inquire after this one. It's a it's a demo saddle. It's probably a beautiful saddle. Um something to think about is like you may not love um how this saddle is built. Right? Um I can't quite tell. It's probably their monoflap model, right, based on the billets here. Um, but if it's the dual flap, which it might be actually, maybe that's actually just the little stand it's on. If it's the dual flap model, I think the saddle might really do it for you. Um, and it's with Louise of Palmer Equine. She's um, an independent saddle fitter down south. She can probably send you the saddle um, to trial ride. Moving up again, let's say that you wanted to really stretch your budget and either go new or maybe chase down a demo. Um, I think a few of the Black Countries might work for you, um, some more so than others, right? Some things like the, the Vinici Solari is going to be too deep. I don't think you and your horse are going to be able to be accommodated by the Quantum. They can't build the right panel option under it. But you might talk to a Black Country vendor about um, the Tex Eventer. Right, you can see again that very open architecture with a sloping cantle that's good for drop fences, um, a nice forward flap for your leg. You might even talk about the new Solare Hunter Jump, right? And look at these prices. It retails at $3,000. Um, do consider that you'll probably be paying tax on top of that. So probably on your budget, Sue, you'd be looking at a demo or a used version. And the person I would call for that in your rough neighborhood is Bill Wood wonderful saddle fitter love him one of my favorites in the whole country very honest guy very experienced unfortunately kind of hard to get 
because he's so good. Um, so do call him, don't email him, right? It's easier to get him on the phone because he's such a busy guy. He reps for um, Black Country. He also sells Frank Baines um, and Ideal Saddle Company. And both of those, um, right? I don't think you're gonna love the Frank Baines Reflex, but you know, I've been wrong before. Um, you may like some of the products from Ideal, like the Ideal Impala. This is a bad picture of it, but I think you might really like that open seat architecture. And again, they can build it with quite a forward flap. And you never know, right? Bill might have um, a demo in his car, right? For 2200, 2400, 2600, that would really work for you. I really like Bill. Do give him a call. I would really recommend it. Um, so let's see what else. I think that's it. I know I've been talking a long time. Um, and if you have any questions about anything that I said, please don't hesitate to send them back. Part of the consultation fee is that I'm happy to answer up to two follow-up emails or if you prefer not to do email, because sometimes it turns into kind of an essay test, I'm happy to arrange a 15 minute phone call so that we can kind of debrief all of this. So I hope that was helpful. I know it was a lot of information. You might want to watch this again and take some notes. And um, best of luck to you and Charlie. Charlie is just adorable. And I'm sure that you will both live happily ever after as lower level eventers. And I hope I'll see you out on course sometime. And thanks for consulting the Saddle Geek.